Well, hallelujah. The one thing that has come through so loud and clear in every vessel this morning is the fact that there's a deep and vital and significant work of God that has been done and is being done within each one of us. We're part of a great purpose of the Father. And only God could bring us to this day. We were discussing yesterday, I think uh, Sister Helen and some of us about healing and how, you know, we see healings in the, in the physical realm and and we're aware that God is doing things in the spiritual realm. And the fact is that the physical is only a picture. When Jesus came and did all the great signs and the wonders and the miracles that he did, you know, people looked at that and, and they followed him for the miracles. They followed him for the loaves and for the fishes. And he told them, he said, he said, you're not here because you saw the miracle, but you're here because you did eat of the loaves and, and of the fishes. And what he was saying to them was, you saw the miracle, but you missed the message. You saw what I did in the natural, but you never saw what it signified in the spirit. And I remember the years back in the 40s and 50s when we saw so many miracles. And I saw blind eyes opened. I saw deaf ears unstopped right before my eyes. I saw those kind of things happen. And yet, you know, at that time in my life, I was following that. Because I thought, man, to see a physical miracle... Uh, I saw a gorter one time as big as a football just go down like you tricked it with a needle right in front of my eyes. And and we thought, man, you know, God is doing great things. And, and we centered in those physical miracles that the Lord did. And we don't discount them. We thank God for them and He still does it. But yet... The message when a blind eye was open, the message was not really that God was just opening someone's physical eyes. But the message is that only God can open the eyes of the blind. And in the realm of the Spirit, it's very important to understand that truth. Because, as some have expressed this morning, they wish that the whole world could hear and understand. And many times we witness and we share with friends or family members or neighbors or somebody we meet along the way. And it becomes obvious to us that they have no ear to hear and no eye to see. And, you know, when you see something, and you're describing it to a blind man, he still can't see it. <laughs> yes. And that's how it is when you try to impart truth to someone who is blind. And try to speak a word to someone who is deaf. Even though you speak the word, they can't hear it. And only God can unstop deaf ears. Only God can open the eyes of the blind. Only God can make the lame man walk. Yes, sir. See? Only God can do that. And so, you know, I, I just sense that God is bringing us to a place in the Spirit to discern what He's doing in every situation. And, and then to follow the Spirit, leave everything in the hands of the Lord 
But knowing that only God can open the eyes of the blind, and the only reason we see today, the only reason we have ears to hear, the only reason we have hearts to understand, is because the Father touched us. Hallelujah. He touched us. The miracle. It came from Him. I could never, in a million years of searching the Lord, have ever found Him to know Him as I know Him. I could not have. I've said this before, but there's an old Eastern saying that says, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. There's a lot of truth in that. And yet there's also a truth that when the teacher appears, <laughs> hallelujah, he will appear because he knows the student is ready. And only God, God's in the whole thing. God working on all the ends. Amen. And so, if we're ready, He made us ready. If He appears, it's His doing. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. So, we can all say together today that this is the day that the Lord hath made. Amen. And we will rejoice and we will be glad in it. The sister shared this morning about how she first came to the Lord through a, a bus contest and she mentioned that she doesn't depreciate that because that was God's purpose that was God's means yes. of, of bringing her to a knowledge of the Lord and we don't depreciate any stage of our journey no we don't no. because you can never get to your destination without walking out every mile of it and if I go to New York City and arrive at the airport and I catch a taxi to, to my hotel, I, I thank God for the taxi. I'm not going to live in the taxi. I can't stay there. It's only a vehicle to get me to my destination. So I, I, I can't live in the taxi but I don't criticize the taxi. <laughs> okay? I don't downplay the taxi. Because I have to have the taxi to get there. So whatever God uses. Yes. And man, He can use some really strange things. <laughs> I, I, I've walked down some really strange dead ends. <laughs> Just... To learn that that is not the way. Now God could tell me that's not the way. And I could hear Him and I could obey Him. But I would never know that I know that I know that it's the wrong way unless He let me walk down there. And then man, when I get back to the trail, hallelujah, I'm so glad to be here. Amen. Let's get on with this journey. Yeah, yeah. Praise the Lord. So God has all these stages in our lives and all these experiences, the, the good and the bad and the ugly. <laughs> Hallelujah. All of it that, that He brings us through to bring us to His purpose. To His purpose in us. But you see, the, the fact is that our today is rooted in our yesterday. And our tomorrow is based upon our today. We have to walk it out. And what He does in us is that every time He brings us into a higher place, into a greater place in Him, He only moves us up by, by taking that which He has spoken to us and that which He has taught us and inworked in us and, and done in us, He raises it up to a higher level. Nothing is lost. Amen. See? When, you're, when, you, when you come in the outer court, you have the fire upon the altar and you have the sacrifice of the animal, you have the blood. And, and you have the priest, and you have all the things that are done in that outer court. And yet, when the priest leaves 
the outer court and goes into the holy place, the only thing that goes into that other realm is an essence out of that first realm. Yes. See, the bullet doesn't go. The altar doesn't go. The labor doesn't go. Only the effect of the washing of that labor goes in. Only the blood from the sacrifice goes in. Only the censer of fire from off the altar goes in. See, it's an essence of that outer court that is raised up and carried into a higher and greater place in God. And then when the high priest goes into the holiest of all, again, the golden altar doesn't go in. The bread, the showbread doesn't go in. The table it's upon doesn't go in beyond the veil. The candlestick doesn't go beyond the veil. But that blood that came from the outer court and came into a higher place in the holy place. And that fire from the altar that came in to a greater place in the holy place. Those essences out of this realm and the incense that is burned in the holy place that wafts its way through the veil to co-mingle with the Shekinah over the mercy seat between the cherubim. The essences of the former two realms make their way into the holiest of all. And they're sprinkled upon the altar. Hallelujah. And they mingle there with His majesty, with His lordship, with His rulership, with His fullness of Himself. Yes. Hallelujah. It's just raised into a higher realm all the way. Much is left behind, but the essence of what God accomplished, of what God is, is carried from realm to realm into the very heights of God. Now then, that just brings us back to where we were last night. <laughs> because we have a two-witness ministry in Revelation 11. And if you want to turn to it, we'll just continue there for a little while. Is, is, is Elwin is, got a word this morning? I don't want to monopolize. We don't know. We'll find out. Okay. I had one, but I don't think I'm going to hear what you've got here. Well, I'll, I'll, I just thought maybe you had a word. <laughs> Okay, the, um, we have the two witnesses, and I mentioned last night the Spirit and the Word. And of course, we could go into a great a theological presentation this morning, uh, uh, an array of scriptures to establish the principle of the witness of the Spirit and the Word, that the Spirit bears witness that the Word is a witness, but we don't need to do that. I think we can hear it in the Spirit. That there are two witnesses, the Spirit and the Word. Someone said that if you have the Word without the Spirit, it leads to legalism. And if you have the Spirit without the Word, it leads to fanaticism. But if you have the Spirit by the Word, or the Word by the Spirit and in the Spirit, then you have the living reality of the harmony of God, yes. you see. But the fact is this, that the Word of God, of course, is not this. But the Word of God is living and energetic yes. and powerful. It's a living Word of God. Now this Word becomes a living Word when it is quickened by the Spirit to us. But the Word is a living Word. But the living Word of God comes to us as a voice. Yes. As a sound. As an understanding. As a knowledge. As a revelation. That bursts within our being. You see, that's the Word. We hear the Word speak within ourselves. 
The revelation is unveiled within ourselves. But then the Spirit of God bears witness with that Word. And the Spirit of God creates and produces within us the very substance and the very life and the very reality of that which is sown within us by the Word, you see. So the Spirit and the Word come together as a testimony within each one of us. And that those are the two witnesses. Now, this is fulfilled in a people. We talked last night about the prophetic ministry. I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy. And they will prophesy for a thousand, um, how does he say it? A thousand two hundred and three score days. And that simply denotes a number that is used throughout the book of Revelation in, in different connotations. You can never get to seven in the context of three and a half, you see. You just can't get there. So what it indicates is that it's an order that God has ordained for a season, Amen. but it will end. How many have ever been in one of those periods? Huh? Amen. Most of us, when we first came into one of those periods, thought that it was a seven. How many times have we thought, I've arrived, this is it, man. This is what I've been looking for. Hallelujah. I remember several times when I found churches and precious brethren and great move of the Spirit, and I thought, brother, this is it. This is the perfect church. This is what God's doing. This is the end time thing. This is it. Let me build a tabernacle here. <laughs> Amen. But you know, I didn't have to stick around very long till I caught the undercurrents. Yes. <laughs> I discerned there was a bit of leaven in that bread. <laughs> and I found out that it wasn't the end of the journey. It was just another step. Yes. And this too will pass. There will be an essence out of it that will be raised to a higher realm yes. in the next thing God does. But that order will pass away. That's what it means they're going to prophesy for 1260 days. Right. They're not, it's not the final word. Beloved, we still don't have the final word. We have a word for this day. Yes, we do. And, and for the thing that God will do in this time and within us, in God's purpose. But I want to tell you, we've entered a kingdom. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. And of the increase of this kingdom. There's no way. There shall be no end. It's an eternal increase from glory to glory. That blows your mind. That's incomprehensible. But there is that eternality in God. There is that which is always true in God. But God brings us through these stages and we must recognize that the day will come when Preston Eva will not be standing up here at this pulpit giving you a teaching. And we'll not even have the blessed order that we had this morning when we heard such marvelous things out of the hearts, out of the life flow of so many precious brethren. How many can believe this morning that God has something greater even than this? Oh, amen. amen? There's only an essence of this that will go into the next thing that God does. God is establishing something in us that will enter in beyond the veil. But what we see here today is not the finished product. It's a 1260 day prophecy. Hallelujah. It had a beginning and it will have an ending. And so we see these two witnesses killed because God says, okay, you've walked this route now. And it says when their testimony was finished, they weren't cut off before their time. The beast that ascends out of the pit didn't smite them and, and wipe them off the earth before God was through. No. When their testimony was finished, the beast rose up and overcame them and killed them. In other words, God had a way of bringing that thing to an end. Yes, he, did. he had his way. And he did it. But then we find that after three and a half days, they couldn't stay dead forever. That was temporary too. Three and a half. They weren't dead seven days. Three and a half days. And the spirit of life entered into them. Hallelujah. And they stood upon their feet and that essence of that prophetic realm that they had been in was caught up to heaven. They were caught up to heaven in, into a new realm. 
And you see, every time that God catches us up into a new place in Him, the realm that we were in before was the forerunner of this day that God brings us into. God always, as we mentioned last night, has a forerunner. Did you know that Moses was the forerunner of Joshua? Yes. He brought the people out, but Joshua took them in to possess their inheritance. Yes, sure he did. Moses just set the stage. And it says, and Moses died. And then the anointing came on Joshua to lead the people in. See? Elijah was the forerunner of Elisha. Yeah. You may remember that Elisha did twice as many miracles as Elijah did. And he had a double portion of the Spirit that was on Elijah. And yet many times we talk about Elijah as though he was the greatest uh, of the prophets. But yet Elisha had the double portion of all that Elijah had. <laughs> Hallelujah. And, and he saw Elijah go up and he caught the mantle. Hallelujah. And he smote the waters and he crossed back and he did greater things. Yes. You see, that essence that was in Elijah was raised up into a higher realm. And Elijah was the forerunner of that which God did in Elisha. We mentioned last night John the Baptist and Jesus. But then also we see David and Solomon. David was the forerunner of Solomon. We hear many more things about David than we do Solomon. But yet David was a man of war. He was not allowed to build the temple of the Lord. He did mighty things and he set the stage for Solomon to come and bring a kingdom of peace. That the fame thereof would be known throughout all the nations of the earth. The majesty, the glory. He built a temple and God filled it with his glory and manifested his glory in the midst of his people. Hallelujah. So thank God for David. We won't depreciate David. David was great. But he was the forerunner of Solomon. And there was a greater glory. And God took all the essence out of David's reign and raised it up in Solomon. Hallelujah. Into a higher plane. Into a higher realm. With a more expansive expression and manifestation of the glory and the purpose of God. <coughs> Hallelujah. So that's what we see. That they were caught up in a cloud. In other words, the essence of what God is doing in us today shall yet be caught up into a higher realm than what we know today. And that's our hope. And I want to just turn for a moment uh, uh, over to the book of Hebrews in chapter 10 because what I see here is that in this catching up into heaven that it it's another type or another symbol of entering into that which is within the veil. Okay? And I see that as something that God is, is working in us in this hour to bring us out of the holy place into the consciousness of the most holy place into a greater glory but we have to pass through the veil. Just as the witnesses died, were resurrected and ascended to heaven, they were passing from one realm to another and they passed through the veil. Now then, in chapter 10, Hebrews and verse 19, he says, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest of all by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Now, many times we read this, and I know in years past, I, I think I probably even preached this sometime, that you know that we have to pass through the veil of flesh, of the flesh. And, and I was thinking that it was this place. In other words, I had to get beyond my flesh in order to enter into the presence of God, the glory of God, and, and the fullness of God. And that's true. But yet, that's not what the writer to the Hebrews is saying. He says that Jesus passed through and we are passing through. And, and what we're passing through is a way that he has consecrated for us. Yes. In other words, we're going to pass through the way that he consecrated. 
And the way that he consecrated is through the veil. That is to say, his flesh. Not my flesh. Okay? Why is that? Because the veil has two sides. One side faces the holy place. And the other side faces the most holy place. It's the same veil. But it faces in two directions. And in order to pass through the veil, you must start on the side that faces the holy place, which is the 1260 day realm. It's the realm of the end part. There's leaven there. There's a wick that's trimmed there. See? There's an oil that has to be replenished. It's an imperfect realm. It always falls short of fullness. But we have to start there. And the way that he is consecrated for us is through the veil which is his flesh. And we enter in, hallelujah, and the other side of the veil faces a realm that is perfect, that is absolutely holy, that is filled with his majesty, the blazing presence of all that he is, incorruptibility, immortality, the glory, the majesty, the dominion, the voice, the full revelation of God himself is there. And we pass through the veil of his flesh, through the way that he consecrated, beginning in the holy place, passing through the veil until we come in him, into that which he has become. You see, that's where it is. That's what I'm trying to say, that it's in him that I pass through the veil. How does he say? Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest of all, not presumptuously, not rashly, not hastily, not by my own will or volition, but by the blood of Jesus, by the way that he consecrated through the veil that he rent for us, which is his flesh. Hallelujah. So what am I saying? I'm saying that only God can open the eyes of the blind. Only God can unstop the ears of the deaf, and only God can bring me from mortality to immortality. Amen. Amen. Only God can bring me from that which is by measure to that which is full. Yes. Only God can bring me from the prophetic realm into the kingship realm. Only God can bring me from a ministry into sonship. See? Only God can bring me there, and it's in Christ. I must identify, he said, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. I find myself in him and I identify not only with what he did when he came in the flesh, but with that which he is in his resurrection, in his ascension, in his atonement, in the highest heavens. Hallelujah. And it's there in him that I pass through the veil. And come to the other side into the fullness of God. Hallelujah. So it's in Him. So what do I need to do today? Do I need to strive to pass through? Do I need to strive to lay hold on what's within the veil? No. I just have boldness to enter by the blood of Jesus. By a new and living way that He has consecrated for me. Through the veil. That is to say His flesh. It's in Him. Hallelujah. And so we follow on to know him. Now then, let's turn over to one more here, and that's in chapter 6. Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 6, and uh, verse 18. That by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, that we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope that is set before us. You know, somebody mentioned this morning about, I forget which one it was, about uh, fantasy. You know, like you're seeing a fantasy. And, and I'll tell you, honestly, many times when I think about what we have proclaimed by the word of the Lord that God is doing and shall do, sometimes it, it's like the, the children of Israel said in Babylon, they said it, it seems as a, as a dream <laughs> to us. You know, it seems as a dream. And sometimes I want to pinch myself and, and say, hey, Evie, wake up. You know? 
Are you in a dream or is this really real? You know, and I think all the prophets of God have, from, from the very beginning felt that way because it says that they sought diligently and inquired to, to understand, you know, uh, the time and the reality of that which they were speaking. They were speaking it by the word of the Lord, yes. but they didn't see it. And yet, the word that they spoke became gloriously fulfilled yes. in, in, in God's time. Now, what I was saying is this. It's not a fantasy. It seems a fantasy. But what it is, is a hope. What does he say? We who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope. Not a fantasy, but a hope. I have a hope. Do you have a hope? I have a hope in Christ today. Amen. Hallelujah. I've had a hope in Him for many years. And many aspects of that hope I have laid hold upon. But yet I have a hope today for something in a higher heaven. Yes, and a greater realm, a greater glory, a greater fullness than what I see today. Hallelujah. And so I have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul. I like that. We sang this morning, It is well with my soul. Why do we say that? We could have said it's well with my spirit. Or it's well with my body. But we said it's well with my soul. Why? Because the soul encompasses the realm of the passions and the emotions. And how many know this morning that emotions can be like a raging sea? They can toss you this way and they can toss you that way. All emotions are very volatile. And they can disturb and they can upset and they can sway. And, and they can cause us to lose our moorings, you see. Emotions, that's the soul. The, the, the will and the... Emotions and the desires are all, part, are all parts of, of the soul. So he says that we have fled here for refuge to lay upon the hope. Which hope we have as an anchor. And what does it anchor? It anchors the soul. Hallelujah. So that as I fasten on this hope, I'm not swept and tossed about anymore. As Paul said, being no more children tossed about by every wind of doctrine and every wave that sweeps over you. You see, God's establishing us. I heard that this morning. Yes. I heard it out of every mouth. Yes. That through the dealings of God and, and the trials and the tribulations and the pressures and the troubles and the victories and the triumphs and the glories, that in it all, that God has brought a place of peace, a peaceful habitation. He's brought a place of understanding and of accepting His will and of trusting Him explicitly in everything. God has brought an establishment in His people. And that establishment, you see, that thing that establishes us is that hope that we have that becomes an anchor for the soul. Praise the Lord. God's doing that. It's very practical. We said last night, it's very practical. But God is doing that in us. We're becoming more stable. You know, I was thinking, driving over here the other day, I thought, wow. You know, we've been coming to Duncan for over 30 years. 30 is the age of maturity. We ought to be getting mature. <laughs> in, in our relationship over here, with the brethren in Duncan, it ought to be reaching some kind of a plateau. And it has. But you know, I sense that today. That God has brought a stability in all of us. A solid rock stability. We have grabbed onto that anchor. Hallelujah. And that anchor is the hope. And the rope that goes from that anchor is anchored to Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. The one that is passed through the veil. His flesh. It's anchored oh, to who He is. What He is. Where He is. What He has. What he's doing. All that Jesus represents. Hallelujah. Our anchor is there. And it anchors our soul. 
So he says that, I, that, that um, whether sure and steadfast which entereth into that within the veil. Okay, which hope we have? Let's back up here. As an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which entereth into that which is within the veil, which I just said. Whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Hallelujah. Hmm. Hallelujah. Thank God for the anchor. And thank God for the one that's on the other end of that anchor. Hallelujah. The Rock of Ages. I heard that this morning too. The Rock of Ages. That's where the that's where the anchor holds. Praise the Lord. Now then, just to continue on here for a moment. Uh, back in Revelation chapter eleven, verse twelve, they're caught up into a cloud. Verse thirteen, in the same hour, there was a great earthquake. And I think probably every one of us can identify with that this morning. Yes. That every time God catches us up into a higher realm, the very next thing that follows <laughs> is a great earthquake, a great shaking. Why? Because he says, I will shake everything that can be shaken. Mm-hmm. And he said, once I've shaken the earth, but this time I will also shake heaven. So isn't it amazing that they're caught up to heaven and the first thing that happens, there's an earthquake. Why? Because in order for us to identify with the new realm in God, he has to shake loose from us everything that pertained to the previous order. See? He has to shake that out of us. So we identify wholly with the essence that is passed beyond the veil into this new realm, into this new place in God. So there was an earthquake. But now notice this. And a tenth part of the city fell. Why a tenth? Now what city? <laughs> well, it's, it's that great city. He says that later. Or, or it, sa- it said, uh, I believe a few verses up. It's called the great city. And I believe it's eight times that the term the great city is used in the book of Revelation. And it always refers to Babylon. But Babylon is Jerusalem. Yes, it is. It's the harlot, the faithful city yes, yes. that has become a harlot. It's God's people that have apostatized, that have committed adultery with the world and the flesh mm-hmm. and, and, and with the ways of man and the earthly realm, you see. And, and that city is Babylon. But he says a tenth part of it fell. Now listen to this. What is a tenth? A tenth is a tithe. Who does the tithe belong to? It belongs to the Lord. But how many know that all the rest belongs to the Lord too? Amen. Amen? Amen. God doesn't just own the tithe. But you see, the tithe is the first fruits. And God has uniquely claimed the first fruits for himself, but for a reason. Because not only is the tithe a first fruit, but the first fruit is an earnest. And we know what an earnest is. It's like a down payment. It's a security. It's something you pay down to guarantee the balance. That the balance will be paid. When you give earnest money, you're saying, I want that. I'm going to have that. And here, I'm going to shut up and I'm going to put up. Here's my earnest money. <laughs> okay? And, and this, you sign the papers and you pay your earnest money and, and, and you got a done deal. There it is. So the tithe is a first fruit and the first fruit is an earnest. Guaranteeing the balance. So why would God send an earthquake and shake down a tenth of the great city of Babylon? Simply because he's saying, I'm going to shake the whole thing down. But I'm going to do it first in you. (laughs) You're the first fruit. Okay? 
So the tenth part of this city is fulfilled in us individually as God first shakes that thing within us, but it's fulfilled within us corporately as God shakes that kingdom of Babylon in a people, calls them his own, makes them his first fruit, uses them as his earnest, and thereby signs and seals the covenant for all men, for all creation. Every one of God's people will come out of Babylon. Yes, amen. The city will fall. It will be burned with fire. The buzzards will consume what is left. Hallelujah. The whole thing will be obliterated. And today, I'm looking at God's tent. Hallelujah. His down payment. You're his down payment. You think, oh, God just had to get the Babylon out of me so I could be a son, yes? But he's doing it not just for you, he's doing it for them. Mm -hmm. You're the earnest of his inheritance. Hallelujah. So this is the tenth. And there was an earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell. And in the earthquake quake were slain of men... 7,000. Now, you know, the, most of the Bible commentators read that, and I've read some really weird stuff. Those that literalize the book of Revelation, you know, they have these 7,000 people dying over there in the Middle East or somewhere. And in all these terrible calamities that are going to happen out there in the world somewhere. But you see... The earthquake is in us. And Babylon falls in us. Now, the interesting thing is that if you read this in the Greek text, it doesn't read the same as King James. Because here it says that, um, it says, and the earthquake, in the earthquake were slain of men 7,000. But now here's the Greek, and you can look it up in your inner linear. Your um, diagot, whatever you've got. The Greek actually reads that there were slain 7,000 names of men. Not just men, but names of men. Okay? Now, right in the book of Revelation, you can find several times what that means. The Lord said to one of the seven churches, He said, Thou hast a name. Yes. That thou livest, but thou art dead. Okay? They had a name. They had a reputation. They had a nature. They had a, uh, a, 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 a state of being that they lived in, that they presumed was something other than what it really was. Thou hast a name that you live, but you're dead, he says. And oh, there's others that get a new name. Hallelujah. Thank God for the new name. Yes. And I'll tell you, the new name is written on a white stone. And the new name will not pass away. Amen. But the old name will. Yes. The old name goes. You don't get a new name unless you relinquish the old name. So when 7,000 names of men are slain, it's, again, we have 7,000. The numerology in Revelation is marvelous. It's a perfect number. It simply means that God completely, totally, fully, absolutely, and forever brings to death our name. Whatever that name represents within us, whatever name we have, Whatever nature, whatever reputation, whatever fame, whatever we think we are, whatever other people think we are, if it's not the, the thing that God is speaking, the name that we have, He says, I slay that name. And guess who those 7,000 are? They're the same ones. The two witnesses. 
Because that's where the earth, they're, they're the ones that went up to heaven. They're the ones that got shaken by the earthquake. See? And, and they're the ones in whom Babylon fell. They're the ones that became the first fruits. They're the ones that became God's earnest. So it's in them that everything of the carnal mind and the flesh, everything we would cling to or propagate or promote that is not of him is slain. The name slain. Not, not just our being. It's not dead body right out there in the desert somewhere. But it's something that God is doing very, very deeply within us. And I like this. And the remnant were frightened. That doesn't mean they were scared out of their wits. It simply means that they were brought to a state of reverence. Yes. Of awesomeness before God. And I tell you, I know what that is. And I know that you know. Because so many times I sit in meetings just like this meeting this morning. And I am so awed by the presence of God. And so awed by the word of the Lord. And so overwhelmed by what I hear coming out of God's people. The depth of the river that flows out of God's people. And I see the work of God in a people and how God has led a people so diverse. Most of us are from different backgrounds, started in different places. We've journeyed different routes to get where we are. Many of us spent most of our lives not even knowing each other. We had different teachers. All of that. And yet, we come together and I see the the, the depth of the work of God and, and, and the scope of the understanding of His purpose and the commitment to His will and the vision and the hope that has anchored the soul. And I'm on. I'm overcome. I'm overwhelmed in the presence of the majesty of God in the people. Hallelujah. And that, that's the truth. So the remnant were frightened. But what did they do? They gave glory to God. Hallelujah. Isn't that what we've been doing this morning? Giving glory to God. Everyone that came up here was giving glory to God. Hallelujah. Because he had led them. He had directed them. He had challenged them. He had transformed them. He had delivered them. He had given them peace in times of trouble. He had given them joy in seasons of sadness. He had given them victory in times of pain. Hallelujah. He had established within them a kingdom that cannot be moved. Glory to God. And you'll never know that unshakable, unmovable kingdom until you've passed through every jot and tittle of what I just read. Amen. That's how it happens. That's the work of God. The remnant was frightened. I'm frightened. Oh, yes. Oh, brother. I'm on. And I don't have to be here in your midst to be awed. Sometimes I just sit out on my front porch praying and contemplating on the thing that God has called us to. And I tell you, I, I, I just tell the Lord, I say, Lord, I don't know what your hour is, but I'm here. <laughs> you know, Samuel, Eli told Samuel, he said, if you hear that voice again, just say, here am I, Lord. Here am I. Samuel became the greatest prophet in my estimation. Yes. You know why? Because he so heard the word of the Lord. And so did the, the, the will of the Lord. That it, it was said of him that not one word that he spoke fell to the ground. Amen. There's never been a man that I can see of that stature until Jesus walked this earth. How can you say that not one word would fall to the ground? You can only say that if you've truly heard the voice. Amen. And if you have truly spoken only what you heard your father speak. See? That's where it is. So Samuel, all he had to do was answer. The Lord called him, Samuel... And he said, I'm here. 
<laughs> I'm here. And that's what I say to the Lord. I say, Lord, I'm here. I can't dictate to God about the next step. Mm-hmm. See? I can't remind God of a thousand different ways that He could do it. Because I know God's got a million ways He could do it. My puny little thousand ways that I might explain to God how He could do this thing, <laughs> it is pitiful. <laughs> so what can I do? I just sit there in my chair, look at the mountains, contemplate the majesty of God, and say, Lord, I'm here! Hallelujah! Because I know that just as surely as I woke up one morning, as I told you last night, and that old leg moved like it hadn't moved, I know that God has an appointed time, and we're going to step into something so far greater and so far beyond anything that we have known. But we are, we do have hold of the anchor. Hallelujah. That is connected to the one that's already there. Glory to God. We're grounded. We're established. Hallelujah. We've been shaken. The tenth of the city has fallen. Amen. Our name has been slain. And if God didn't do it directly, He raised up enough other people to slay our name. (laughs) Amen. He'll get rid of our name. Let him that thinketh he is something take heed. Lest he fall. See? Oh, yes. God will take our name. And he'll slay 7,000 of them. Amen. And then we'll be affrighted. And then we'll give glory to God. (laughs) Amen. Oh, Lord, only you can do this. (laughs) Hallelujah. Only you. I know that only he can do it. Yes. Amen. I take a lot of vitamins and I take a lot of herbs and a lot of stuff. Some of you probably saw me taking them. But that's not going to bring immortality. (laughs) That's not going to bring the fullness of God. I trust it might preserve this old thing until a new day. That I can step into. But even that is of the Lord. I'll take whatever benefit I can get from the vitamins, but I want to tell you, I give glory to God. Only God can open the eyes of the blind. Only God can unstop deaf ears. Only God can bring us through the veil. You say, well, we've entered beyond the veil. Yes, in a sense we have. But have we appropriated the fullness of that realm? There's still an entering in. I believe that. Hallelujah. I'm going to close. But they gave glory to the God of heaven, and that's where we were this morning. Giving glory for what he's done. Oh, what is that old song we used to sing about? Great things thou hast done. I can't remember just what it is, but you know, some of you know. That's in my heart this morning. Great things thou hast done. Now, my closing is this, verse 14. The second woe is past. How many woes are there in Revelation? Three. The second one is past. Now, we used to think that was woe, woe, woe upon the world. You know, those poor devils out there. Boy, you know, after God raptures us all out of here, they're going to get it. Three woes going to come on those poor people. But at this point, it's connected to the two witnesses sent into heaven. It's connected with the earthquake. It's connected with the tenth of the city falling. It's attempted with that old name of ours being totally slain. See? It's connected with the remnant being affrighted and giving glory to God. And as soon as that happens... The second woe is past. Hallelujah. It's over. What is the woe on? It's on everything that God is shaking that can be shaken. That's what the woe is on. It takes three woes to complete the work. Hallelujah. So, that's why there's 12 more chapters in the book of Revelation. (laughs) Hallelujah. (laughs) This is just the second woe. But this is our will. Yes, it is. Have you ever felt that way? Woe is me. Yes. 
under the severe dealings of God? Woe is me. Amen. I felt that way. It, it, it's a woe. It's not on those guys that we thought it was going to be on. One morning I woke up and realized I was him. Amen. And the woe is right here. Amen. But thank God the second woe is past. And it's past when we really have this work done and can come to the place where we can reverence the Lord and give glory to God. Hallelujah. Oh, Father, we just bless you this morning. Hallelujah. We thank you, Father, that this is not just an ancient vision that somebody had, but it's a revelation of your Spirit within our hearts. It's the very work of the living God. We thank you for it. We reverence you in our hearts this morning. And for whatever else you have for us in this service, for whatever work you continue to do in each one of us today and in the days to come, we reverence you, we sanctify you in our hearts, and we give glory to you. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord.